mulțumesc mult în primul rând pentru invitație, pentru oportunitate. Am mai fost, am mai fost acum trei ani, când da, s-a ținut, cred că exclusiv fizic. Dar da, este foarte, mă bucur foarte mult că am posibilitatea să vorbesc despre da, ceea ce lucrăm noi aici. Sigur, e biroul e în Brașov, dar de fapt suntem toți colegii sau colegii din echipă sunt distribuiți prin toată țara, mai ales acum de când cu modul de lucru hibrid sau de acasă cu, cu pandemia. Um, nici nu știu să continui în limba română, lim- ce zic, în engleză mi-ar fi mai ușor, nici nu știu audiența, e exclusiv? A, română, audiența sau? observ că este, în, este orientată pe români, dar putem să întrebăm, ne scrieți în chat dacă v-ar deranja dacă Lucian ar vorbi în limba engleză? Din punct de vedere al terminologiei ar fi mai simplu. Cum îți este ție, cum îți este ție mai simplu așa? Pentru că de principiu cam toată lumea înțelege. Okay. Elina zice ai. <laughs> Presupune că nu-i, nu-i deranjează no, și, și înaintea ta tu ai prins partea de discurs a lui Vlad și Ionuț în limba română, dar ei au vorbit în engleză okay. o bună parte din prezentare. Oh, dar, da, n-am, n-am go știu, ahead, da, da. speak in English, everybody will... <laughs> okay, ok, so I'll continue in English. So, yeah, today I'll talk about deep learning for medical image analysis. So, maybe just as a quick introduction, so, yeah, our group here in... Uh, in Romania, so it's not really, not only Brasov, we're uh, overall 50 to 60 people uh, really working on the AI side. I think we're, we're around 25 people and uh, we're basically part of uh, of uh, the global research group of, of Siemens, who's doing research on medical data, uh, of course, mainly with the goal of adding uh, AI-based uh, software products on the medical scanners that Siemens is being developing. So, yeah, that's CT scanners, MR scanners, ultrasound, angiography, and so on. So I'm going to talk about a bit about, yeah, what we're doing, um, yeah, how, how we're using AI uh, specifically for medical images, because this is the main field where we use AI and uh, yeah how this translates into into products and into into what Siemens is offering uh, through their equip- equipments in in hospitals so maybe just two introductory slides right so probably you know all these terms starting from artificial intelligence which is really the overarching term and going down to to deep learning yeah which has become very popular i would say yeah during the last decade Um, and this is mainly due to uh, to two developments, right? So on one side, uh, we have now access to large amounts of data through all the developments in network, connectivity, and so on. And secondly, uh, the appearance of general purpose GPUs, specifically introduced by NVIDIA, I think in 2006, uh, allowed us or gave us the hardware which allows us to train such uh, deep learning based models very efficiently so the theory of deep learning is many de- so or was introduced many decades ago but basically we did not have the hardware to to really uh, leverage its power so what what we see on this uh, slide which is yeah not necessarily related to a specific use case but generally uh, yeah accepted is that If you have few data sets, then really deep learning and traditional machine learning, basically there's not really a big difference between them. But where deep learning really comes with the, yeah, with an advantage is when you have big data. So when when you have big data, then your error, right? You see here on the y-axis is the error. Your error decreases uh, much more compared to traditional machine learning, which, yeah, at some point it becomes, uh, becomes limited. So basically what, what I'm going to talk about today is how yeah, Siemens will leverage this AI technology across the entire data continuum. So we see here different levels where AI is being used or can be used. And uh, you also see here on the bottom 
the the scope of the data integration access and complexity so basically we start on the left side with the let's say very little complexity and the more we go to the right the complexity increases so it's, it's not about just the complexity of developing the AI model but also complexity of accessing the data and gathering the data uh, that you really need for developing the model. So basically, with AI technology, we start at the level of data acquisition. So even ju just using all the, let's say, the, the scanners that there are, when you acquire the data, typically you have some, some basic sensors that give you the raw data, and then you have the task of processing that raw data and present it to a clinician. Right, so basically generating the medical image that the that the clinician sees. So already at this step, we can use AI to provide a better image in shorter time. And I, I, I'll get back during the presentation to all these uh, different steps. Then, of course, the second level, which is currently, uh, yeah, I would say the one where AI is mostly focused, is the one of data processing and interpretation. So that means once you have acquired the data, you have the medical image, and now you need to interpret it, right? So here, uh, nowadays, there's a huge pressure on clinical personnel, so on physicians, to take decisions uh, in a few seconds by looking at these images. So, uh, of course, this is error prone. It's not scalable. So then, yeah, with the power of AI, we can help the clinician to take uh, or to, to present him conclusions, uh, to present him intermediate results such that he can take a better decision. Um, yeah, moving forward at the next level, we have the data data fusion, right? So we can have multiple scanners or multiple sources of data. And the goal is to fuse this data, to bring it together, again, to help the clinician during during a procedure to to for him just to do, do his job better and have a better patient outcome. The fourth level uh, is already in the area of advanced analytics and prediction. So here, basically at the patient-centric level, the goal is to bring all the data that is available for a patient, to bring it together around the patient, and then to go beyond what AI is offering, right? So beyond AI, of course, you can have other types of uh, modeling that you can use, like physiological modeling, like the digital twin. So here, really, the goal is to bring all the technologies that are available, uh, use the data, all the data of a patient, and then this would allow you actually to have a digital twin of the patient, uh, which would then give you a lot of, uh, let's say, possibilities to try different uh, treatment strategies, try different interventions, everything virtually, such that in the end, again, the clinician can take uh, the best decision for the, for the patient outcome. The final level here at the cohort, let's say at population level, uh, this is not necessarily uh, something that is of interest for us at Siemens. It's something that should be of interest at let's say regional level or even at country level, right? So let's say we take Romania. We know, or we look at statistics, okay, what, what are the major health issues in Romania? Probably it's cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, stroke, and so on. So here at this level, you could actually use AI to analyze the data and to define health policies which would allow you to target better the, the different population, let's say pathologies, different risks, uh, such as to reduce them on the long term. So now let's uh, let's start going, uh, yeah, over over the different uh, steps. So we're going to start with the data acquisition and the generation step. So here, one one example is basically for uh, for CT and the MR scanners. Uh, I've just had my, my first MR scan this year. Uh, nothing serious, but yeah, everything went well. So uh, for those who, who have experienced this, right, you, you, there you are placed on a table before going into, into the scan. And uh, yeah, the idea is that the more you, the more information you extract about the patient, 
the better will be the scan that you do, or the, basically the better will be the medical images that you can generate after the scan. So here uh, we're using AI to, yeah, to analyze the patient once the patient uh, is, is placed on the table and uh, yeah, to basically generate this personalized avatar where you detect the different parts of the body, you detect the surface of the patients, you, you basically have then his volume, you can estimate the weight, you can predict the internal anatomy as you Can you still hear us? Please write on the chat because I lost uh, you, Lucian. Is it my problem? Okay, uh, let me try to reach him via something else. Okay, let's just wait for him. Maybe he has some technical issues. I'm trying to reach him right now. Okay, he's reconnecting. Hi, sorry everyone. Hi. We lost you for some minutes. I'm sorry. Some minutes? Oh, I thought. Some of, yeah, uh, well, close to a minute. <laughs> okay, sorry. Hope, I think it's a network issue okay. on my side. Hope it doesn't happen again. Um, yeah, so I was talking about the, about the um, avatar that we're reconstructing here in the uh, CT and the Mars scans with the goal of uh, estimating different landmarks of the patient such that when the clinician really does the scan, he can uh, focus the scan, uh, even the, the radiation basically in case of CT on the right, on the right region. So really, if, I know if you want to have a scan focused on the heart or on the lungs and so on, you want to you wanna really generate the optimal image for that part of, of the body. So we can move now to the level of uh, data processing and interpretation. Um, I'm going to have here a, f a few examples. So again, basically at this level, the goal is to uh, help the clinician in uh, extracting information from the medical data that was acquired, um, yeah, such that he can take a better decision in less time. So one, one of these examples is uh, the, the reading of chest CTs. So chest CT is one of the most uh, common exams that is being done when a patient presents, for example, to the emergency room, he has some chest pain. This can have multiple causes, right? So then uh, the clinician typically says, okay, let's do a chest CT. And then, yeah, you can have some issues with the heart, with the lungs, with the aorta, with, yeah, di different sources. So then... Here we have developed an algorithm which basically takes this image and analyzes all, all these different possible issues and it highlights them in, let's say, this kind of dashboard view to, to the clinician. And uh, yeah, it, you, you can see here basically the results. So uh, the clinician has then a better diagnostic performance. Uh, the reporting time is reduced by 63%. And uh, also the inter-user variability. So basically when you have multiple users uh, reading these scans, if, if they don't use this tool, then there will be large variability between them. But if they use this tool, then this variability is being reduced. So yeah, provides a lot of, uh, a lot of advantages. And yeah, this is a, a product that is uh, already out there on the market provided by, by Siemens. Um, Another uh, another application is that of coronary artery disease. So coronary, art coronary arteries are really the arteries which supply the heart uh, with, uh, with blood, with oxygen, with the nutrients, everything that it needs. And 
basically these are really tiny arteries, but uh, any issue that appears here is critical because basically it will lead to a myocardial infarction. So uh, it's coronary artery disease is really the uh, single most important cause of death worldwide. And uh, yeah, what we're doing here again, using CT data is to, to, to employ this multitask AI system. So basically uh, a model that solves multiple tasks at the same time. And you can see here the different, the different types of uh, uh, outputs that it provides. So basically it takes, it takes the input image, it encodes it, right? It has a, to, to a Latin representation and then it starts to output the different uh, different aspects in parallel. So basically it detects if there is any disease, it tells you how, how severe the constriction is. So basically what you see here on the image, this is an artery. And what you see inside the artery, this is a contrast agent, right? So to, to be able to see the artery on the image, you have to inject into the patient a contrast agent. It's uh, based on iodine. And uh, yeah, once uh, you have done this, you take the scan, so then you can see very nicely uh, the inside of the artery where the blood flows. And then, of course, we can detect all the different things like, yeah, as I said, if, if the diameter is, is reduced because you have there some, some plaque, which is typically either calcium or, or a fat deposit. Uh, at the same time, you see that the image itself can have issues, right? Because uh, doing a CT scan for the heart is very difficult because the heart is moving, right? The heart is beating. It, it, it's, it never stops beating, so it's, it should never stop beating. Uh, so because of these beats and this continuous motion, you can get artifacts in the image. So you see here such an artifact, which is given by this motion, which if not detected correctly, you could mis misinterpret it as disease. So you could say, okay, this is a constriction, but in fact, it's not. It's just because the the heart was moving and it it generated this uh, this artifact in the image. And of course, the most important uh, output of this is the segmentation, which yeah gives you really how uh, yeah how large the artery is, and then the clinician takes a decision uh, based on uh, yeah how severe how severe the constriction is. Um, yeah, also, also in this uh, in this field of coronary artery disease, something we developed was to predict an invasive measurement. So th there is an index, it's called FFR. I'm not gonna go now into details. It's, it would take a bit more time, but the idea is that for some patients, the clinician goes with a pressure sensor inside the heart. It, he measures the pressure and then takes a decision based on, on that measurement. And what we developed is a method that uh, basically does a computer simulation of how the blood flows in the heart and then tells you whether, uh, basically tells you the value of FFR without having to, to go inside the patient, which of course represents a risk, it is costly, it increases the, the intervention time and so on. So, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll get back to this if if time allows uh, with 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 an example. Um, yeah, another activity at this level is related to um, cardiac MR. So cardiac MR or MR in general is is uh, one of the best techniques, imaging techniques. Why? Because it has no radiation. So if you do CT or if you do angiography. Uh, or just simple x-ray, there's also its radiation, right? So you, you, don't, you, you cannot really do too many such scans in a short period of time because then you will start having other issues as a patient. MR doesn't have the, this issue. Uh, of course, it has other disadvantages. It, it takes, currently it still takes a lot of time to do an, an MR acquisition. I just had one for my shoulder this summer and I think, yeah, it took like 30 minutes. So, yeah, uh, one of the activities here for us is really to try to reduce this time. Uh, but what I'm going to talk here about is, is an approach for cardiac MR. You can see here the, the heart moving 
inside such an acquisition. And one of the goals is to estimate the size of the heart. So you can see here with the red, uh, the red circle is the interior of the heart. So basically where the blood is. And between the red and the green circle is the myocardium. So that's really the muscle of the heart, which uh, you see when it enlarges, it becomes thinner. And then when it contracts, it becomes thicker. So, uh, and one, one of the clinical measures of how well the heart works is the ratio of the minimum and maximum volume of the heart. So basically, a heart that is very healthy is able to pump a lot of the blood uh, outside from the heart. A heart that is diseased will have a much smaller motion. Right, so this is typical. This is an example where the heart is healthy. In an unhealthy case, you would see that it it really con uh, contracts very little. Now, what was so? Of course, the goal is to 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 do this analysis automatically, and yeah, to not have a clinician, I know, mark this region or yeah, basically draw this contour in in the image. It takes a lot of time. So we can generate these contours automatically. We can uh, predict uh, then this measure. It's called ejection fraction. That's why I have here EF. So EF is the ejection fraction. So basically how much of the maximum amount of blood in the heart is being pumped out during the contraction. Um, so one of the issues we had here with the data was that all the data we had or almost all the data we had was in a healthy range. So an ejection fraction of 50 to 70% is healthy. So you see, the amount of data with a reduced ejection fraction was very little. So then one issue if you, when you want to train and develop such an AI model is that if you have very little data for certain ranges, it will not do a good job there, right? So it, the, the AI model will do a very good job in this range, but here where the data is very sparse, the prediction errors would be high. So then what we did here was to generate synthetic data, such as to obtain a relatively uniform distribution of the data, right? So you see here, once we generated, or the synthetic data has this distribution. So basically you have synthetic patients, virtual patients, both with low ejection fraction and with high ejection fraction. How did we do this? We There is a, a certain uh, type of deep learning model. It's called GAN, Generative Adversarial, Adversarial Network, which uh, has this capability of generating synthetic images. Probably have seen them uh, on the news or yeah, of faces of people that actually don't exist and were generated with such models. So here the goal was, to, to generate synthetic images. You can see here some examples of synthetic and real images. You cannot, uh, yeah, a, a clinician might be able to distinguish between them, but uh, really what's important is this part of the heart that should be as realistic as possible. So the, goal, the, the strategy here was really to start from a mask of the heart. So these masks, you can generate synthetically quite easily, right? You can, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can contract them, you can enlarge them. So you, can, you, you have all the freedom to generate uh, synthetic samples of such masks. And then once you have those masks, with, you, you train this model. Of course, you train it on real images, but then once it's trained, it can generate synthetic images given such a mask. So this is what we did. Uh, these are the results. I'm not going to go again too much into into details, but basically uh, you, we can have a look here at the error. So if we don't use synthetic data, we have an error of 4.5, 4.9%. And once we use the synthetic data, we're able to reduce the error to 2.7%. Uh, and uh, if we look here at the EF range, you see here. So this is the scatter plot. Here on the x-axis, we have the ground truth. So basically, what was the real ejection fraction? And on the y-axis, what's the ejection fraction predicted by our model? So you see here, especially in the range of low EF, uh, the error is quite high. So now once we did the pre-training, you can see that basically the model is performing 
here in the low EF range, as well as it does in the high EF range where there are a lot of data points. So this paper that we uh, yeah, published just this year, one of, one of our PhD students published it in Nature Scientific Reports and uh, yeah, we're very happy with the, with the results. Lucian, now, yes. Lucian, before you go uh, for, further, one of uh, one of the attendees asked you to please hide the bar that says uh, "Vfer Zoom oh. is sharing" because they yeah. couldn't read the small things. I was not aware that they see also that. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. So moving to the to the next level of data mapping and fusion. One example we have here, again, related to, to the heart, you see um, maybe as a parenthesis out of the, I think out of the 25 colleagues that we have here in Romania in the AI team, uh, around half of them are working on cardiovascular applications. It's just because cardiovascular disease is, uh, yeah, the most important class of diseases worldwide. And as I said, coronary artery disease specifically is the most important cause of death worldwide. So yeah, we're doing all we can to yeah, develop software to 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 try to help clinicians in, in treating those patients. So one coming back to uh, coronary artery disease. So again, what we see here, so basically this is the heart. And what we see here on the outside, these are the coronary arteries, which supply the heart with blood. So what can happen for some of the patients is that one of these arteries becomes blocked completely. So normally such a blockage would lead to myocardial infarction. But if the patient is lucky, then he develops a so a so-called collateral circulation. So basically, the part of the heart muscle that should be supplied by this artery, which becomes blocked, is then supplied by a different artery. So that's called the collateral artery. So yeah, there are there are certain. Th th this is basically something where you have a let's say a genetic predisposition. So some of some of uh, uh, some people have this predisposition. So basically, even if an artery gets blocked, then uh, there will be a collateral artery that will supply that part of the heart. So then the patient will not die or not suffer a major heart attack. Uh, but of course, you don't want to leave the patient like this. You want to, you want to open up this artery and to, to restore the blood flow. So what we see here on the left is the CT image. Uh, computer tomograph. What we see on the right is the angiography. So this is an image that is taken invasively uh, with the patient on the table. On the left is an image that a CT that is being done prior to the intervention. So what we do here with the data fusion is that we take the image of the artery here. You can see the blood flows up to somewhere here. This part of the artery here is then completely blocked. And then you have here again, blood coming in from another artery, uh, the collateral artery. So what the clinician wants is really to, to, to remove this blockage, to restore the blood flow here. But on this image, on the, on the right, so basically the image that the clinician sees live with a patient on the table, you, you cannot see that part of the artery, right? Because there's no, there's no blood flowing, it's completely blocked. So, through this data fusion, we take the information from the CT taken prior to the intervention, we map it on the angiography such that the clinician can see uh, where the artery is supposed to be. So then this gives him an information to, to let's say, proceed more confidently in uh, yeah, uh, restoring the blood flow uh, yeah, through, through that artery. Okay, going now to the to the patient centric level. As I said, here we're moving beyond AI, right? So AI is basically uh, at this point uh, we're quite far away from yeah from from general purpose AI and so on. It's still like a, we can still see like an algorithm which yeah you train it and uh, yeah if you train it well it does a good job. If not, then uh, it will just pretty garbage. So going to, to be able at this point to go beyond what AI can offer, 
we, we, we need to bring in more information. So one type of information is really from, from, from physiological models where you can simulate the different aspects of the heart, right? So, and here there are like three main aspects. First of all, there's the hemodynamics, basically how the, how the blood flows uh, inside the heart. Then there is the mechanical part, how the muscle contracts. And there is, then there is the EP part, so electrophysiology. So basically the electrical signals that initiate this contraction, right? So in essence, that's what it is. So you have an electrical signal that initiates the contraction, the muscle contracts, and because the muscle contracts, the blood is uh, pumped out of the heart through the arteries. So there are these three different aspects that you you have to model correctly, but if you do so, basically you have a digital twin of the heart. So you have a, a computer model of the heart, uh, reconstructed, of course, for this specific patient because the anatomical model. I think we have we we can see it on the on the next slide. So the, here are the the three aspects that I was uh, mentioning: the electrophysiology, the mechanics, and the circulation. So the hemodynamics. Of course, everything starts from the anatomy. So you acquire your medical image. Uh, there you see the uh, geometry. You can reconstruct the anatomical model, and then you can simulate all these different aspects. And the good, as I said, the good part of this or the nice part of this is that once you have this digital twin of the heart, you are able to uh, try different treatment options, right? What if I do this? What if I do this? So if your model is good enough, then uh, it will, uh, let's say, be a, a high fidelity representation of different treatment scenarios. And then the clinician can really take uh, the best decision for the patient. And again, this is something that is really now in, in uh, uh, clinical evaluation at different hospitals uh, around the world. And uh, yeah, results are, are, are very promising. <clears throat> something else where uh, we, we, we worked on, especially here in the team in Romania. So apart from this, uh, from the, let's say Siemens funded projects, we're also uh, taking part in publicly funded projects like national projects or EU projects. And as part of one of these projects, we developed a technology where we uh, combined artificial intelligence with homomorphic encryption. So homomorphic encryption is a, it's, it's a special type of encryption where once you have encrypted your data, you can still perform operations on it. Yeah, right. So, for example, let's say you have the numbers two and three, and you want to do a sum of them. So, two plus three equals five. So, with homomorphic encryption, what you can do is you can encrypt number two, you can encrypt number three, you get two encrypted messages, which, which basically you don't understand, but then you can still do an, uh, a sum operation, so the addition on these two messages. You obtain another encrypted message, which, when you decrypt, will be the right result. So in this case, five. So why, why we're doing this, uh, or why we developed this as part of a Horizon project was specifically in the context of GDPR, right? So in the context of GDPR, uh, it has become much more difficult to have access to uh, patient data. So yeah, patient, the data is owned by the patient, the, pay, the data is within the hospitals. So it has become much more difficult to get access to real uh, patient data. So then we came up with this solution where we encrypt the data within the hospital, uh, we bring it in a cloud environment. Here we train an AI model on this encrypted data. Again, as I said, special type of encryption called homomorphic encryption because yeah, if it's regular encryption, you cannot really do any processing on that data. So on the homomorphically encrypted data, we train a model. Once the model is trained, of course, we deploy it as a, as a cloud service. And then the hospital, if or when a new patient comes and he wants to use, the clinician wants to use this AI service, he can do so by encrypting the input data. He receives an encrypted output, which he then 
decrypts inside the hospital. So basically the, the plain text, the unencrypted data never leaves uh, the hospital, uh, is never seen by anyone outside of the hospital, but still it allows uh, the clinician to use the uh, power of AI to, to help him in the treatment decision. And this uh, basically this solution was, uh, was also awarded by the EU Commission. There's a special competition for this Innovation Radar Prize, where every year they, uh, uh, yeah, they hand out prizes to the most important uh, innovations. And uh, yeah, luckily this was one of the uh, prized innovations during that year. Yeah, coming back now, as I said, we're uh, yeah we're part of this global team, and uh, basically for as I mentioned, right, so for training such uh, AI models on large amounts of data, you need a supercomputer. So as I said, we're part of this global research group. And uh, within this group, we have where, where the head headquarters is in, in Princeton in the US. And uh, all the data that is available or that was acquired and has become available is there part of a data lake. And we have there a supercomputer, it's called Sherlock, and uh, yeah, which is able to run every day hundreds of jobs where hundreds of scientists are doing their experiments and developing their models. So we're, we're uh, yeah, we're terming this concept uh, AI factory, which yeah, has, has basically three components. Uh, one is the supercomputer, as I said, we have the big data office with a data lake. Basically, this uh, here are like a special team that is focusing on the legal and on the contract parts to to be able to acquire, and then also the technical tools to ingest the data into the data lake. We have the AI factory core, where we have the AI scientists, uh, as I said, spread around the world. Uh, we have clinical reading and annotation. So this is, a, of course, a very important part. We're mostly working with the supervised uh, models. So when you train a supervised model, you need to have ground truth data. The ground truth data has to be generated by someone. So then we have a large team of uh, clinical experts which are able to annotate uh, different structures, different diseases and everything they see on the medical images. Uh, yeah, so by having this infrastructure, then we're able to, as I said, to uh, on one side to train a lot of models, but then also to have enough data such that uh, these models produce uh, good results. Uh, yeah, here are a few details on the team in Romania. So as I said, we're over 50 members. We're uh, divided into three teams, the AI team, which I am heading, then the cloud computing team and the medical imaging productization team. And um, yeah, I think, so something where we're really proud is that of is that we're covering the entire development life, life cycle. So really from understanding the clinical problem from, yeah, let's say idea generation to developing the annotation tools, developing the proof of concept, uh, protecting the intellectual property through patent applications, developing clinical prototypes. And then of course, if everything goes well, uh, bring it out as a product. And we're covering all the different medical imaging modalities and even non-imaging data. We have a few colleagues who are working on uh, natural language processing because this is also, of course, part of the medical data are also the medical reports, uh, which yeah, require NLP technology to be interpreted and, and, and processed. Um, yeah, in terms of, let's say, in terms of AI, I, I already mentioned that we're also covering or attracting additional funding through uh, European projects. I think many, we have currently in the team seven PhDs, uh, another seven PhD students. So uh, we have also very, very strong collaboration with the local university, Transylvania University of Brasov, uh, yeah, where people then do their PhDs uh, let's say in parallel using industry support. And uh, yeah, I think 
that's that's it mostly for today. I think yeah, scheduled around for 45 minutes presentation. So the rest should be should be up for discussions or yeah questions that uh, that you may have. So yeah, thanks a lot. I hope yeah you could hear me well. And apart from the one interruption, everything went well. Thank you. Thank you, Lucien, for, for the presentation. It was quite interesting to, to see it. Uh, I have to admit that I also uh, took a screenshot of one part of your presentation and posted it because it, I think it's amazing what, uh, what things are being done and especially with people from, uh, from Brasov. It's not only you, it's a group of people that work on this together with other scientists and people from around the globe. But it is interesting to and important to understand that here in Romania, we have smart people that help the world. So I think, yes, yeah, so one thing, yeah, thank, yeah, thanks a lot. So one thing I think I didn't mention, so the group started its activity around 2010 when, <laughs> when I was still doing my PhD. And yeah, since 2010, we have been steadily growing and yeah, we hope to keep it that way. And we have actually, to be honest, also now people who have done their education abroad and also their PhDs, but they specifically wanted to come back to Romania and uh, yeah, they are now part of the team. So it's, it, it's something that is possible, right? <laughs> people don't always have to leave Romania to, to, to find, let's say, interesting things to do. Especially now with the remote work, like you said. It's, it's becoming easier and easier to, yes. to work from Romania as well. Um, yes. I'm hoping people yes. will uh, use the chat to ask questions. If not, I have a, uh, I have a question um, for you. Um, and the question is more about do you, um, the work that you've been doing, uh, I'm guessing is based on the real data or yes. most of it should be real data from different hospitals, dif yes. different clinics, different practitioners that help you with it. Um, where did it all start? Did it start in the US with a small clinic that wanted to improve or did it start somewhere else or with a big clinic? I don't know. Um, I mean, the group itself, uh, as I said, so the headquarters is in Princeton. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it started around the year 2000. Actually, it was again somebody from Romania. His name is Dorin Komonicu. So he, he, uh, yeah, and he's heading actually today, uh, or heading <laughs> since several several years, this global department. So he left Romania. He in '95, I think, he did his PhD in the US, and then he basically, uh, yeah, brought or, yeah initiated this team of research within Siemens. Uh, and since 2000, it has been growing and growing. We lost you. How did we lose him again? Cum l-am pierdut din nou. OK. Să vedem dacă mai poate să mai intre. Sper că vi s-a părut interesant E interesantă prezentarea. Eu voi încerca acum să dau din nou de el sau îl așteptăm pe Lucian să mai intre odată. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry again for this. <laughs> da, ești, ești iarăși cu noi. Ceva se întâmplă cu internetul la tine? Nu. Yes, 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 Astăzi yes. nu vrea să lucreze, să coopereze cu tine. Uh... Yes, yeah, so I just heard we've lost you, so that mm -hmm. I, I, I was able to hear. So, yeah, as I said, basically the team uh, yeah grew out of the U.S. and of course, as they started their collaboration or their work, they started, of course, the collaboration with different clinics. What I can say is, for example, here in Romania, we since 2012 we've started also collaboration with the Clinical Emergency Hospital from Bucharest, so the Floreasca mm -hmm. Hospital. And uh, yeah, nowadays we have actually multiple collaborations also within Romania with the uh, clinical cardiology in Cluj, with the clinical cardiology in Târgu Mureș, and also, of course, also with Bucharest, also with the hospital in the private hospital in Brasov. So, yeah, we, yeah, basically, 
it's the let's say the goal is to find clinicians which are also research oriented because then mm -hmm. they will also be let's say willing to to explore these things and yeah to, to basically get on this journey with us to try to understand and to develop the these models which yeah they 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 feel that they need them they feel that they also let's say have their limitations not only in terms of time that they have every day but also in terms of let's say how much complexity they can uh, they can interpret so, because it, it's clear that algorithms in the end will if they are fed with the right data and right amount of data will be able to do a better job than a clinician so may, maybe not today but in 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 near future that will be the case so yeah okay because you mentioned you are working with some clinicians that are too oriented towards research. Yes. Do you validate your um, models against what they are seeing? I mean, once you, you, you get a bunch yes, of, of course. data, of you course. put it in the yes. algorithm, algorithms, the algorithms are providing an answer. Do you always, I mean, I'm guessing you are validating the words. Yes, that, yes, okay? yes. So, that yeah, so that, that's, that's a very important step. Once, let's say, we have the data, we develop something, we feel that it works. The next step then is to have a so-called clinical prototype. So it's not mm -hmm. really something that they would use routinely for patients. So it's not a product, but then we we give out this clinical prototype to them. They can test it in the clinic on, I know, 100 patients, 200 patients, and then they can, can give us feedback. Okay. Uh, and of course, also, basically, there are also uh, part of the Siemens team, so Siemens employees, we have clinicians, okay. which are also Siemens employees. So they, which are also, which, yeah, help us in generating these annotations uh, to, yeah, because some, some of the things, of course, we as non-clinicians can see in the images, but uh, yeah, when, when it gets to more, more complex stuff, then of course we need their clinical expertise to, to understand. What is your success rate? Success. <laughs> What's the latest yeah. model success rate, if I can ask? Like 50 Ac you mean in terms of accuracy? Higher. or it, 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 de it, it depends a lot, right? So, we, I mean, when, when we're talking about detecting things in the image, uh, accuracy or die scores of above 95% uh, okay. are common. Right, so you can have nice. even. I think we had ninety-eight percent, ninety-nine percent. So, but th this is really something when, when you have to predict something that you really see on the image, then okay. there are other tasks where you see the image, but basically mm -hmm. the image does not contain all the information that you would need. Maybe you would also need some additional measurement from the patient and some clinical history of the patient. So then. When when you have such use cases, then yeah, naturally your accuracy drops. So it's it's uh, it's really it really depends case by case. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. I see that the uh, audience they are not that big in number. Uh, that is uh, that is true, but they haven't asked uh, any questions. So I would really really like to to thank. You. It was interesting uh, to see what is happening. It is interesting to see. Uh, where we are as a nation, as and you as a group with uh, Siemens, because you are helping a lot, and um, we are glad. <laughs> uh, like and the we're Americans all, we're say, we are glad for, for your service. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're always looking for more colleagues. I mean, I think especially, <laughs> especially our reactive has grown a lot. I think three years ago, we were around 14 people, and now we're 25. So it's it's okay. going the right direction. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, okay. Thanks a lot.